Michael Epstein presiding. You may take your seats. Please enter your appearances for the record going from left to right. May it please the court, Caroline Quill, Rice and Quill, 600 Greenwood Ave, Wyckoff, New Jersey, for the plaintiff, Carmen Capella. Thank you, Ms. Quill. May it please the court, Megan Rice, Rice and Quill, 600 Greenwood Ave, Wyckoff, New Jersey, for the plaintiff, Carmen Capella. Thank you, Ms. Rice. May it please the court, Sean Six of Six and Barbaro, uh, for the defendant, Etzion, 600 Greenwood Ave, Wyckoff, New Jersey. <laughs> May it please the court, Craig Barbaro, Sticks and Barbaro, 600 Greenwood Ave, for the defendant, Petscon. Uh, is going to be an statement? Yes. Um, Your Honor, pursuant to Rule 5-6-1, I would like to request a pre-trial conference to pre-mark the exhibits. There are four exhibits which have been increased in size by stipulation of counsel, and I would like to have the exhibits pre-marked. If, if the exhibits have been uh, agreed to by both sides, we can uh, commence with pre-marking them. Okay. Have both sides agreed that the documents are going to be admitted into evidence? They're stipulated? Yes. Then we can mark them into evidence. What are the exhibits in order? Oh. Do you know what they are or what numbers they oh. are? Uh, objection, Your Honor. We have not agreed to all the exhibits. Um, we have agreed to three of the exhibits, but one of the uh, exhibits we are, are not in agreement with. The, the exhibits are P3. Uh, they're, they're standing on the stand over there. Okay. So three, are, three have been agreed to? One cannot. Do you, you agree with that? Yes. Okay. So the one that's not agreed to, we will have to deal with at the appropriate time during the trial. The three that have been agreed to, we can move into evidence. Okay. And there is one, Your Honor, that's not Uh, we can we can set it aside um, and then uh, we can raise it when uh, the party when the point of the evidence we can address it with, a, with the objection at that time. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Megan Rice, and I am the attorney for the plaintiff, Carmen Capella. Carmen has brought a claim against the defendant, Petsagon, for negligence. I will address the claim in a few minutes, but first I would like to discuss the facts of the case and testimony you may hear today. Carmen owned a dog, Sally Capella. Sally was a West Highland Terrier. Sally was not your typical dog, though. She competed in dog shows. Sally competed in both local and national competitions and won. Today you will hear that Carmen first purchased Sally from a breeder in West Virginia in October 2009. Sally was Carmen's first dog and she took great care of Sally, grooming and training her. One of Sally's groomers suggested Carmen enter her in a local dog competition. Not only did Carmen enter Sally, but they won. Today you will hear that during Sally's short life, she won $120,000 in competition prize money. At the end of Sally's life, she competed in the biggest and most competitive national competition, the American Accredited Breed Dog Show, and won. At that competition, Sally won $110,000 and the most coveted prize, Best in Show. After winning Best in Show, Sally had the opportunity to be sponsored and endorsed by huge pet companies. This would lead to much more revenue for Sally and Carmen, but sadly, Sally died shortly afterward. We are going to prove today that Petsicon's negligence is responsible for Sally's death. After Sally won the American Accredited Breed Dog Show, Carmen returned home with Sally and noticed that Sally was uncomfortable. Carmen thought Sally was displaying signs of fleas. This would not be unusual, as Sally had been around many dogs at the competition. <coughs> Carmen gave Sally a bath with flea shampoo. The flea shampoo did not seem to give Sally relief, so Carmen used a Petsicon spot-on flea treatment. Immediately, Sally shown, showed signs of toxic shock. Today you will hear from Sally's veterinarian, Alexander Delani, that she displayed the signs of acute pyrethroid toxicity. 
Dr. Delani will explain that Petsagon's spot-on treatment contained pyrethroids, which are toxic in small doses, but kill fleas. Additionally, you will hear Carmen explain that she read the directions and used the product appropriately. She did not see any warning label on the bottle, and Carmen had no idea of the potential dangers of the product. Carmen, the plaintiff, claims that Petsicon was negligent. Negligence is defined as a failure to use the care that a reasonable person would use in a similar situation. Carmen does not have to prove that Petsicon was evil or intended to harm Sally. We simply have to prove that the company departed from the standard of care another company would have used given the same circumstances. It is important to note that Petsicon is a $2 billion company. This is not a mom and pop company. This is an international company whose customers rely on its reputation and representations. Today you will hear its slogan is be a responsible pet owner. After hearing Carmen's testimony, I submit you will understand that Carmen herself was a responsible pet owner and bought into Petsicon's slogan. Carmen also alleges the Petsicon product was manufactured defectively. Today you will hear that Petsicon manufactured both type 1 and type 2 pyrethroids. Type 2 pyrethroids are substantially more dangerous. Today you will hear testimony that the company was put on notice its products were dangerous. Last and most importantly, Carmen is alleging that Petsicon failed to warn of the potential side effects of the product. I ask you to listen carefully to the testimony and ask yourself, how difficult is it for a two billion dollar company to put a proper warning label on its product? I further ask you to look within yourself and ask what duty does Petscon owe any dog, including your dog or your neighbor's dog? Last, we need to prove damages. Today you will hear from Jameson St. Clair, the president of the American Accredited Breed Dog Show. He has prepared a chart which will describe that a prize winning dog can win upwards of $500,000. It is Carmen's position that Sally could have won much more than that. I appreciate your time and attention. I also ask that you listen carefully and put yourself in Carmen's situation. What would you expect of Petsicon? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for taking your time out today. Uh, I, my name is Dora Coyle, and I represent the defendant, Pensacon. This case is about the death of a dog, and that's a tragedy. Many of us own dogs. We love dogs. It's a natural reaction when we hear our pet has been hurt, or a loved one has been hurt, to want to strike out, to want to blame. It's a natural reaction. We all have it. We want to say, hey, someone is responsible for our pain, our sorrow. And sometimes there is a person who's responsible for our pain and our sorrow. But today, you, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear that it's not Petsicon. First, I'd like to point out that it's a plaintiff who has the burden of proof. It's their job to prove to you negligence. We as a defendant can sit here. We can do nothing. And if they do not prove the elements of negligence, then they have not proven their case. Not only do they have to prove negligence, they have to prove damages. So while possibly, I don't believe, but possibly you may fall, feel that Petsicon is at fault. However, you also have to feel that there were damages to compensate the plaintiff. Today you're going to hear from the defendant's witness, Pat O'Connell. She is the president and CEO of Petsicon. Pat O'Connell is going to confirm what the plaintiff just told you, that this is a $2 billion company, not a mom and pop. And you're going to hear it's not a mom and pop company. What you're going to hear is that this is a serious company. This company, this $2 billion company, turns around and takes 25% of its profits and puts it back into its products and makes them that much better. You're going to hear that. Additionally, you're going to hear that they have investigators on staff who go out and every time that there's an issue with one of their products, they send these investigators out, and they go out, and they question what's wrong with the product, and they make the product back much better. This is a serious company. 
this is a serious company, and they took Carmen Capella's claim very seriously and sent an investigator out. And unfortunately, if they felt that there was an issue, they would have compensated her. But they did not feel that there was an issue. And you're going to hear that. So there was no compensation. Above and beyond that, you're going to hear from the investigator, Sam Stone, who's going to tell you he met with Carmen Capella. And last, you're going to hear from Val Poppinjay. And Val Poppinjay is going to tell us that even though, even if you may find that there's negligence on Hetzikon's behalf, there simply aren't the damages to warrant a jury verdict uh, in favor of Carmen. What you're going to hear is that it, it's extremely expensive to maintain a show dog. And above and beyond being expensive to maintain a show dog, it's very unlikely that one will be successful. We all know that from sports figures, from actors, actresses. We all want to be that person. But the chances are very unlikely. And the cost is very high. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to listen very acutely. Listen to all the testimony. And I think after you hear all the testimony, you're going to find that there was no negligence on behalf of Petsicon. Are we prepared for our uh, first witness? I would like to call the first witness, Carmen Capella, to the stand. Please excuse the court clerk who is just uh, <laughs> providing you with a beverage. <laughs> Carmen Capella, you can take the stand. We will dispense with the swearing in. All witnesses have been pre sworn to testify on their own. Please state your name for the court. Carmen Capella. Where do you reside? 67 Craig Road, Hillsdale, New Jersey. Let me draw your attention to exhibit P3. Could you do me a favor, counsel? Could you just open up the exhibit so that I could see it? Because I can't see it from my angle, if yes. you don't mind. I appreciate you. Just that's perfect. Thank you. And this way the jury can see it as well. Thank you. And this is P3. P3. Thank you. Let me draw your attention to exhibit P3. Do you recognize this dog? Yes, that is my dog, Sally. Where is Sally today? Uh, she's no longer with us. I'm very sorry about your loss. What kind of breed was Sally? She was an ivory-colored West Highland Terrier. Where did you purchase her? I purchased her from a breeder in Chestnut Hill, Virginia. How did you hear about this breeder? Um, I did a lot of research on the internet, as well as hearing it from many of my friends. How much did you pay for Sally? I paid about $2,000 for Sally. Have you ever owned a dog before Sally? No, I have not. So how did you learn to train and take care of her? Uh, well, again, I did a lot of research on the internet, um, as well as learning from both uh, my groomer and breeder uh, for how to take care of Sally. How did you train Sally? Uh, well, at first, when she was younger, I just taught her the basic commands, such as sit, stay, lie down, all those basic commands. Uh, and then when she was about nine months old, I put her in puppy training sessions. How did Sally do at these training lessons? Oh, she did uh, very well at those um, training sessions. Everyone always commented on how well she did um, and her ability to focus on the task at did you wind up hiring a personal trainer or handler for Sally? Uh, yes. Um, uh, Caesar Nylon approached me um, uh, to become my handler um, and to show Sally in competitions. Did you enter Sally in competitions right away? Uh, no, but after thinking it over, um, I thought, why not give it a shot? What was the date of Sally's first competition? Uh, it was in December of 2010. How did Sally do at this first competition? She did very well. Uh, she won Best in Show, and even though there was no monetary prize, uh, she did receive a lovely trophy. Did you continue to enter Sally in more competitions after? Uh, yes. I entered her in state and regional shows, and she did very well in those. Did you win any Petsicon products at these competitions? Yes. What was the date you won a Petsicon basket? It was in February of 2011. Did you continue to enter Sally in more competitions? 
Uh, yes, after that I ended her in the double A BDS. What is the double A B BDS? Uh, the double A BDS stands for the American Accredited Breed Dog Show and it is a national competition held every year in Washington DC for only the finest caliber of show dogs. How did Sally do at this competition? She did very well. Um, she did not only win Best in Breed uh, with a $10,000 reward, but she also won Best in Show uh, with $100,000 in rewards, money, and possible endorsements. It must have been very exciting. Uh, what happened after you won? Um, well, immediately after uh, Sally had won, uh, we were inundated with press, photographers, and pet representatives um, from pet companies all over the country. Um, and even though we weren't used to the spotlight, Sally seemed to be enjoying it. Did you purchase any insurance for Sally? Um, yes, I purchased an insurance policy for Sally that was about $6,000. What does this policy cover? Uh, it covered uh, veterinarian bills and um, possible reimbursements from endorsements due to the fact that Sally could not complete the endorsements um, due to tr um, uh, death, disfigurement, and injury. Did you drive Sally home from the competition? Yes. How was Sally behaving on the ride home? Uh, she acted completely normal on the way home. What happened when you finally arrived home after the competition? Um, I noticed that she was itching a lot and after taking a look at her, I noticed she had signs of fleas. So did you apply any products on Sally? Yes, I applied a flea shampoo and Petsicon flea treatment. Had you ever used the shampoo before? Yes, I've used it a few times before this. How did Sally react to this shampoo? Uh, it had no effect on the fleas. Had you ever used the Petsicon product before? No, I've never used it. So how did Sally react to the Petsicon treatment? Uh, she did not react well to it. Um, she was very lethargic, um, unstabilized, um, and you could tell her back legs were a little bit um, dragging. Are you s absolutely certain the second product was Petscon? Yes, I'm mm. certain. How can you be so certain it was Petscon? Um, well, I noticed right off the bat uh, their insignia and logo on the front saying Petscon, and I could not mistake their uh, slogan on the back, be a responsible pet owner. Did you take Sally to a vet right away? Uh, no, I did not. Why didn't you take her to the vet right away? Uh, at that point, uh, it was 11 o'clock at night, and I just n I did not want to trust her with anyone but Dr. Delani because I knew she would get the best care from him. So what did you do instead? Uh, instead, uh, I basically um, I gave Sally food and water, made sure she was comfortable in bed, and then I went to sleep, but I made sure I checked on her every hour. Um, and then I was planning on going straight away the next morning to Dr. Delani. So what happened the next morning? The next morning, I woke up 7 o'clock in the morning and took her straight away to Dr. Delani's office, and she was the first patient. All right, back to uh, when you applied the Petscon product. How big was the bottle? Um, I'd say it was about the size of a uh, travel-sized sprayable hand sanitizer. Do you still have the bottle? No, uh, it obviously did not work, so I threw it out. Did you follow all directions for applying the product? Yes, I read through all of the directions thoroughly. Did you see a visible warning label on the bottle? No, I didn't see it. Finally, did you have a necropsy performed on Sally? No. All right, thank you. No further questions. I'm sure this is a very tough time in your life. You just lost a loved one, and I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, can you tell me, you said that the um, AABDS was held in Washington, but is it, is not it held in Metropolitan? No. It's not? It's held in Washington, D.C.? Yeah. Okay. Um, you bought an insurance policy from someone at, where did you buy this insurance policy? Um, it was from a vendor there. Where at Washington in, in Washington D.C. at the show, and it covered things such as endorsements, and yeah. can you explain? Uh, it covered uh, veterinarian bills and reimbursements from endorsements due to the fact that Sally was injured, uh, disfigured, or uh, happened to die. Mm. Yes. Okay. And 
Did you get any money from this in insurance policy? Um, just a couple thousand from the veterinarian bills. From the veterinarian bills, but nothing from the endorsements? No, I had not um, set up any endorsements yet with Sally. And um, when you went to the competition, I know from my experience, I have a dog who competes, they usually take these dogs and groom them with products. Can you tell me, um, do you know what your dog was groomed with? Um, I do not know the exact company, but mm. it was the um, usual products that my, uh, actually my groomer had come with me to Washington, D.C. Um, so he had used all the normal products that uh, he used on Sally whenever she got groomed. Okay. Um, and when you got home, you said that she was itching, correct? Yes. Okay. And you, what did you, after you saw that she was itching, what did you do? Um, I went to give her a bath, and while um, I was giving her a bath, I noticed uh, signs of fleas. Okay. And what did you do after you saw the fleas? Uh, well, I went to get one of uh, the flea shampoos that she had, and I applied it. And once that didn't work, you applied the Petscon product, correct? And when you apply this Petsicon product, um, can you describe what the bottle looked like for me? Um, it was uh, cylinder-like in shape. Okay. It had a spray nozzle on the top. Okay. And the uh, the label and the slogan and like the nutrient. Can you explain what that looked like? Um, well, on the front of the bottle, uh, they had the Petsicon insignia mm -hmm. along with Petsicon written on it, and then um, under it, it had. Um, the ingredients. Okay. And then onto the back, it had um, the Petscon slogan, the irresponsible pen owner, and then the directions. Okay, and you did not see a warning on this pro uh, product? No, I did not. I, have you ever used a Petscon product before? Um, I've just um, some food. And you are a responsible pet owner. Have you ever read what the, the label on the food? Yes. And is there a warning on the food label? And there, it's almost it's the almost the exact replica, but there's a warning, correct? I guess. Okay, so when you picked up this bottle and you read it, and it said Petscon, be a, and then under it had the nutrient facts, and then on the back it said be a responsible pet owner, and under it were the nutrient facts, and you did not see a warning label. Did this draw any, I don't know, suspicion or anything? Um, no, I wasn't really focused on that at the time. I felt that their slogan served a good enough purpose. I felt I was being a responsible pet owner and I was just worrying about um, having Sally get rid of the fleas. Okay. Um, no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Capella. So you indicated you put the Pensacon um, you put the Petsicon product uh, on Sally, and then can you specifically tell me what happened to uh, Sally after you put the um, Well, product? within a couple of minutes of applying the Petsicon treatment on her, I noticed that she became very lethargic and unstabilized. Um, she was kind of wobbling, uh, and I noticed her back legs uh, kind of started to drag. Okay, so her back legs drop, drop, dragged. Dragged? Did yeah, I say that correctly? Okay. Yeah. They dragged. She's wobbling. Okay. Did she do anything else? Um, not really that much other than that. Okay. So she's dragging and um, her back legs gave out, it sounds like. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to your affidavit. Is this your affidavit? Do you recognize this to be your affidavit? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You recognize that to be your name? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to draw your attention to line 65 and I'm going to read it. Within minutes, I knew something was terribly wrong. Sally's hind legs were dragging, and she was leaning to one side. She tried to jump onto the couch, but actually fell backwards, landing on her back. It was a terrible sight. That's your affidavit, correct? Yes. Okay. That sounds a little bit more serious than what you're saying here this afternoon. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess. A little okay. Bit. Okay. And then when she fell, and it was a horrible sight, what did you do next? Uh, well, I... First, uh, just I made sure that she was all right. Um, Did you pick her like, up? Yeah, uh, I when I saw it, she didn't fall completely off the couch. She just kind of like tried jumping up, and then she just didn't quite get on it. So it wasn't um, like she fell just totally back. So I knew it, she was okay. I just made sure 
I checked her, and then I put her in bed with some food and water. Okay, so you picked her up and put her in bed? Yeah. Okay. Did you roll a ball to her at all? No. Okay. Did you tickle her on her tummy? Yeah, I gave her a little rub on her tummy when okay. I put her down for bed. And how did she react to that? She seemed okay. Uh, she was still a little lethargic. She was, she was still a little cool. lethargic. Okay, she was still a little lethargic. Okay. So after this sight, and that sounds terrible, and I'm sorry you went through that, did you make a phone call? Actually, I know you did not make a phone call because you did not put it in the affidavit. You did not make a phone call to the local veterinarian, correct? Well, I tried making a phone call, but um, no one responded. So. You tried making a phone call. I'm going to draw your attention once again to your affidavit, um, and you t show me where in your affidavit you indicated where you tried to make a phone call. When you gave it's sworn testimony. Okay, so you didn't think it was important that you actually tried to call someone? Well, if uh, the call wasn't answered, I figured I could just wait until the next morning because she didn't seem that terribly um, uh, involved. Or she didn't seem very, uh, you know, I wasn't that concerned with her health. I mean, I knew she, I would take her to the vet the next morning, but it didn't seem like she was sprawled out dead on the floor. Okay, well, is there anything you could have done from the point that she fell off the couch and you had that horrible sight it, and 7 o'clock the next morning? Is there anything you could have done, as such as made a phone call? It's a yes or no question. Made a phone call, called your vet. Is there anything you could have done? Yes or no? I could have been. Okay, and there's actually more than one thing you could have done. You could have done several things. You could have taken to an emergency all-night vet. You could have made a phone call. You said to me... Or you said to, uh, you gave testimony and indicated that you looked at the box. There is a 1-800 number on every single Petsicon product. Did you make a phone call to that 1-800 number? No. No, you did not. Okay. I did not see that phone number. Okay. Um, now, it, the, your dog was itching. And... Then you said you saw telltale signs of fleas. Yes. Telltale signs of fleas. But you didn't actually see fleas because you would have put that in your affidavit. Isn't that accurate? No, I saw fleas. Okay, but in your affidavit, and I will draw your attention once again to your affidavit, it, say, it says telltale signs of fleas. Well, a sign of fleas could be the fleas themselves. Okay, but this says telltales. If you saw fleas, you might have stated, I saw a flea. All right, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. Okay. Um, so you actually saw fleas? Yes. Oh. Um, okay, no further questions. Thank you, State your name for the record. Dr. Alexander Delani. What is your occupation? I am a doctor of veterinary medicine. Do you have your own practice? Yes, I do. Where is your office located? Nine Beverly Lane, Wyckoff, New Jersey. Where did you attend veterinarian school? St. George's in Granada, and I also interned one year at the University of Florida. What type of veterinarian medicine do you practice? I have a mixed practice from small animals to large animals. How long have you been a veterinarian? 16 or 17 years. Are you a member of any professional associations? Yes, the American Holistic Medis uh, Veterinary Association. Are you familiar with Sally Capella? Yes. How do you know Sally? I have been her vet ever since Carmen got in. Are you familiar with pyrethroid toxicity? Yes. Could you please define what a pyrethroid is? A pyrethroid is a natural incesticide that Objection, shares... Your Honor. There, there's no uh, unfair extrapolation. Your Honor, Dr. Alexander Delani is an expert win witness and a pyrethroid is very relevant to this case. It's not in his affidavit, so they're unfair extrapolating because I don't what, what that he can make up any definition of a pyrethroid possible. Counsel, I'll allow it. Go ahead, Doctor. You could you could you could explain to us what a pyrethroid is. Okay, a pyrethroid is a natural insecticide that shares similar traits with natural pyrethins, and they are used in many flea shampoos to kill fleas, and when they are used in a larger amount, they can kill small dogs such as Sally. 
Do you have any specific or special training relevant to treating animals with toxicity? Yes, my three years that I spent at St. George's, I saw many cases due to the lack of education of the pet owner and due to the lack of proper medicine. And at my one year at the University of Florida, I saw many similar cases also, and 75% were fatal. <coughs> what occurred on October 20th, 2011? Sally was presented to me, and I diagnosed her with acute pyrethroid toxicity due to, the, due to her symptoms and the history that I took from Carmen Cabello. Could you please explain your analysis of Sally after she was presented to you? Sally was presented to me with the following symptoms. She had dyspnea, difficulty of breathing. She had tachycardia. She had a heart rate of 150 beats per minute, and the normal range is from 60 to 100. She had hyperthermia. A, she had 103.5 degrees Fahrenheit. That was her temperature. And the normal range is from 100.5 102.5. She had hind leg paralysis, which is slight or incomplete paralysis. She was lethargic and overall disoriented. How would you diagnose these symptoms? She had pyrethroid toxicity. What was your recommendation? I recommended Carmen to go home and leave her in my care. What treatment did you perform? First, <coughs> I gave her a bath with gentle rubbing <laughs> and after I saw her symptoms were not getting any better she was she remained dyspneic and the temperature rose uh, we put her in intensive care what happened to Sally's symptoms after you put her in intensive care they were still not getting any better what did this eventually lead to this eventually led to her having another seizure and then dying in her own arms when did Sally die Sally died on October 22, 2011. Do you believe that if Carmen had not waited to see you that morning, Sally's condition would have been different? No. Can you repeat that? Do you believe if Carmen had not waited to see you that morning, Sally's condition would have been different? No. Based on your previous knowledge, did Sally have any medical problems that might have made her prone to toxicity? No. Was a necropsy performed? No. What is a necropsy? A necropsy is like an autopsy for animals. They cut open the body and see the exact cause of death. Do you normally request a necropsy to be performed? No. It's the animal is very near and dear to the heart of the owner. In your opinion, in your expert opinion, what what do you believe that the, was the proximate cause of Sally's death? The proximate cause of death of Sally Capello was pyrethroid toxicity, which she got from Petscom. Thank you, Dr. Delani. No further questions. Thank you, Dr. Delani, for taking the time out of your busy practice to come testify today. Um, Dr. Delani, you stated that when you were in medic medical school, you treated at least two to three cases of pyrethroid toxicity a year, correct? Correct. Isn't it a fact that most, if not all, fatalities from pyrethroid toxicity came from the misuse of a product? Uh, well, either the misuse of a product or exposure to pyrethroids. Or exposure to pyrethroids. <coughs> you also stated in your affidavit that um, you never use any non-holistic products on your pets, nor would you recommend them, correct? Yes, for a reason. What is that reason? That reason is that sometimes in these unnatural medicines that, in Sally's case, are pyrethins were used in a greater amount than what they should have been used at. And I thought, I think that natural medicines won't have that risk. Mm -hmm. um can we backtrack for a second? And you said that it comes from a misuse of a product, pyrethroid toxicity comes from a misuse of a product or from exposure to pyrethroids, too correct? Too much pyrethroids. Yes. How, can you explain how an animal is exposed to too much pyrethroids? Well, they're used in many flea shampoos to kill fleas, and those are in small amounts to kill just fleas, but when they're used in larger amounts, 
they kill dogs, such as Sally. Mm -hmm. Oscar was not necessary. Um, now, in these 15 years of med since medical school, have there been any advances in technology or medicine that could have stopped pyrethrotoxicity? Yes or not only, please. No. No, there's, so there's been, you're trying to say that there's been no advancement in medical technology that could have prevented Ms. Capella's dog from having pyrethrotoxicity? Not in the technology. Okay. Um, Carmen Capella told you that she applied an unnamed flea product, um, unnamed flea shampoo, right before she applied the Petsicon spot-on treatment. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, is there a possibility that this unnamed flea shampoo could have been the cause of Sally's death? Yes or no? Only please. There's a possibility for everything. So that is a yes. So yes. Yes. Um, Mrs. Miss Capella used this a spot-on treatment for fleas, the shampoo. Um, in your, you never mentioned that you encountered fleas. Why is this? Because they went away after, after um, I, I'm going, going to assume that along with the pyrethroids that were, mm -hmm. that went into Sally's system that okay. Pascal also got rid of the fleas. Okay. Since the pyrethroids were in a, in a large amount, they killed not only the fleas, but the dog also. And can you tell me, can you die, like when you see a dog, how can you diagnose the symptoms of pyrethrotoxicity? Not just by like looking at it, but like before you see a doctor go through, I mean a dog go through dyspnea and tracheartery and all those other symptoms, what are the um, other ways that you can see that a dog has pyrethrotoxicity? What is one of the first things you see? One of the first things I see is just the symptoms that I listed. Okay. Um, is there a possibility that another substance could have been the cause of Sally's death? Yes or no only? It's a possibility for everything, but I truly do believe that it's Petscon. Oh, that is a yes. Yes. Okay. Um, when Sal is brought into you, she, you gave her a bath. Why did you give her this bath with rubbing, not scrubbing? To sort of relax her a little bit, maybe get, that, maybe get the temperature down, you know, because we saw that, her temp that once her symptoms are not getting any better, that it would only get worse and worse for and eventually lead to Sally not being a person. When you see pyrethroids, where are they on it? Where, are they on the dog or in the dog? Inside. They're inside the dog. Inside. Okay. Um, Sally recently competed in a dog competition. Is there any chance, yes or no, that she could have picked up fleas or an illness while she was at the competition? Yes, yeah, she could have picked up fleas from the competition. Okay. You said you would never recommend non-holistic products to your customers, correct? For a reason, yes. Okay. Then why did you never tell Miss Capella about your, not hatred, but your, uh, why did you never tell Miss um, Capella about non-holistic products? Well, she, I, she never asked first, and Actually, I don't know if she asked because I have many customers a day, many dogs coming in. I'm a very busy man, so I don't know the exact words of what one customer said, what another customer said. So I don't know if I talked to her about it or if I did not talk about it with her. Um, did you know, the, um, before any of this happened, did you know that Sally was a competition dog? Yes. You did. And did you give Carmen, did Carmen give you any special instructions since Sally was a prize dog? Spe special instructions for what? Like how to treat her. Like no, did you give Carmen any special instructions how to treat her? She knew what she was doing. She had a groomer to keep care, to keep care of Sally, make her nice and pretty. Are pyrethroids in shampoos? Yes or no? Flea shampoos. Flea shampoos. So the one that um, Miss Capella applied first, that flea shampoo, could, were there fleas? Do you think that there were fleas in there? Fleas in the flu shampoo? I mean, no, uh, pyrethroids. I'm sorry. I do not know. You do, but you just stated that pyrethroids are in flea shampoos. Pyrethroids are in many flea shampoos. Okay. Not all. It, so, uh, Carmen could have used a natural okay. way of getting rid of the fleas mm -hmm. in that flea shampoo. Carmen told you that she applied the pets con flea treatment, correct? Yes. Prior to applying the treatment she applied, 
Right. Um, is there any possibility that the two could have mixed, causing toxic shock? There is a possibility, yes. You said you looked at Sally's medical record, correct? Yes or no? Yes. You did. Is there a possibility that Sally could have allergic to something that you and Carmen did not know about? No. How long have you been treating Sally? I've been treating Sally for about two years. No further questions, Your Honor. Third witness, Jameson St. Clair to the stand. Please state your name for the record. Jameson St. Clair. What is your current occupation? I am currently the president of the American Accredited Breed Dog Show. What is the American Accredited Breed Dog Show? Um, the American Accredited Breed Dog Show, or the AABDS, is the largest dog show in America. It is held in Metropolitan, and it is for the highest caliber of dogs. Before working, did you attend college? Um, yes, I attended Metropolitan University. What? Uh, what did you do after you graduated college? I worked at MP Farm. What graduate school did you attend? Um, while I was working at MP Farm, I was upset, so I left and attended Metropolitan University and graduated in 1984, top of my class with an MBA. After graduating, where did you work? Um, after graduated, I was worked at Petscon. I was the chemical engineer. Did you leave PetsCon on good terms? Um, I wouldn't say good terms, I would say more mutual terms. I signed a confidentiality agreement with PetsCon, so I really can't speak about my parting, but it was, we were kind of starting to part ways, and then I left. Are your feelings towards PetsCon affecting your testimony at all, Mr. St. Clair? Um, no, I keep my business and my personal life, they're two separate things. Um, PetsCon is my personal life and this is my business life and I do not uh, keep them separate. How did you assume the position of president of the ABDS? Well, right before I was about to leave PetsCon, um, some, a few dog owners who had dogs in, competing in the show asked me if I'd be interested in taking over as the head of the show and I was honored by this and I immediately accepted. I, for legal reasons, I changed the name from the Mayflower Dog Show to the American Credit Breed Dog Show, and I brought it to Pet, uh, Metropolitan where I thought it would be under the bright lights. How many years have you been running the AABDS? Approximately nine years. Mr. St. Clair, are you familiar with the show dog Sally? Um, yes, Sally recently competed and won Best in Show at my show. Have you ever testified in a trial before? Yes, I've testified in over 10 civil trials in, not over in nine different states. Do you have an expertise in the valuation of show dogs? Yes. Mr. St. Clair, I would like to draw your attention to Exhibit P1. Did you prepare this exhibit? Yes, it is champion show dogs and the earnings. What does this chart show? Um, it shows the last year's champion show dogs um, of the AKC runner up and the winner, and then the AA BDS best in show dog. I would like to draw your attention to dog number three, Bruno. What breed is Bruno? Um, Bruno, like Sally, is a West Highland Terrier. According to this chart, how much money has Bruno earned off winnings? Um, $250,000. How much has he earned off of endorsements? $250,000. How much has he made off of breeding? $150,000. Can you add up all these numbers for me? Um, yes, it comes to $650,000. What title did Bruno win in your show? Um, Bruno, like Sally, won the Best in Show Award. Like Bruno, could you estimate what Sally is worth for me? Um, yes, Sally is worth approximately... Hold on one second. Go back, please, if you could, to after the $650,000 total. Your question, please. Okay. What title did Bruno win in your show? Um, Bruno, like Sally, won Best in Show. 
Like Bruno, could you estimate how much Sally is worth for me? Um, yes, I would estimate Sally to be upwards of $500,000. Can you explain how, much, how you made this estimation? Well, with the research that is available and witnessing Sally compete in my dog show personally, um, and by talking to other um, experts in evaluation of dogs, I came to this conclusion. In what ways could Sally earn this money? Um, Sally, well, taking it for granted that she would complete, uh, compete in dog shows at a high level for the next four to five years, and granted that she would receive endorsements, that's how, I, that's how she could make money. Would Sally um, receive appearance fees? Um, yes, I know that I would ask her to come to my show, and I would pay her a high appearance fee to compete. Is there a chance Sally could have won the double ABDS again? Um, yes, I would say that there is a high chance that Sally could have won the double ABDS again. Um, seeing how good of a dog she was and how well she competed against the other dogs, I'd say that there is a very good chance. Once again, how much would you determine Sally's worth? Upwards of $500,000. And do your feelings and past relationship with Petsicon waiver this amount at all? No. No, no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Jameson St. Clair. Thank you for taking some time out to testify in this case. First off, I would like to ask, how do you go from being a chemical engineer at Petsicon to being the owner of the AABDS? Um, well, while I was uh, working at Petscom, um, a few unsatisfied dog owners um, came and asked me if I would like to be the head of the show. Okay, and how do you know that Sally would be fine and look fine for the next, for the rest of her career as a dog show, as a dog in, in a dog show? I do not. So you do not know if she could have became lethargic and not be able to fulfill her dreams of going on to winning many of your competitions and winning a lot more money, correct? No. Since she could have defected, and then how could she still compete at a high level, still making the top dollar? She could not have. So it's possible that she could not have made any more money from her career as a, in a dog show if she could have defected, correct? Everything's possible. There's possibility of anything, so yes. Okay. No further questions, Yaron? Thank you. Thank you for taking your time to be here. First, I would just like to confirm, Petsagon is the sixth largest pet product company, correct? That is accurate. We are the sixth largest. Its annual revenue is $2 billion, correct? Absolutely, $2 billion, and we're proud of it. Also, 75% of the revenue comes from the food divisions, correct? Yes, most of our money does come from the food direct, uh, division, yes. 25% comes from non-food products, correct? Uh, that is correct, yes, 25% from non-food. Non-food products include toys, leashes, bulbs, collars, and of course the pharmaceutical line, correct? Uh, yes, but most of our uh, revenue comes from the pharmaceutical line. The pharmaceutical portion is a small portion of your revenue, correct? The pharmaceutical? Oh, well, I would say it, um, in relation to the whole company, the pharmaceutical is, I would say it's probably about 20 We make a decent amount of money from the pharmaceutical portion. Although you set aside 25% of for research and development. Most of that money for research and development goes toward food products, correct? I'm sorry, can you rephrase the question? What was that? Uh, you set aside 25% of your annual income for re re research and development, correct? Yes, we do, and we are very proud of that. We spend a lot of time researching our, our um, products and developing our products, especially before we put them on the market. We want them to be tip-top. Most of that money for, for research and development goes towards the food products, correct? Yes, that, uh, um, actually, no, no, no. Uh, I would like to draw goes your... goes towards the uh, pharmaceuticals. I'd like to draw your attention to your affidavit. Is this your affidavit? Mm -hmm. Let me see it. Uh, I don't see my signature. Is that your signature? 
Oh yes, that's my signature. I would like to draw your attention to line 17. We annually set slightly over 25% of our uh, gross. Can I read that? Excuse me, can I read that? Okay. We annually set aside slightly over 25% of our gross. The majority of that allotment goes to our food group. Uh, uh, that's kind of skewed. Um, a big portion. I know that's my affidavit, but sometimes when you're saying things, it, it gets a little skewed. A large portion goes to the food, but a large portion goes to the pharmaceuticals as well. But you felt that information was not important enough to put in your affidavit? Uh, well, I, I, I think that it's somewhat skewed. I think a, a large portion goes to the food, but there is a, also, given if you compare the two, a big portion goes towards the pharmaceuticals. I'm going to interrupt one second to help. Uh, Ms. Arcano, when you uh, signed your affidavit, you knew you were under oath, correct? I did know I was under oath, and, yes. And you knew when you were signing out an affidavit, you had to be as accurate and complete as you could be, correct? Uh, yes, I did. Because you knew that the affidavit could be used at a trial like we are here today, correct? Absolutely. I'm the CEO of a company. I know these things. And you do. And you know that under oath means to, you were sworn to tell the truth in the affidavit, correct? Yes, but you know, sometimes you get confused. Yes, I do know that. Uh, did you say anywhere in the affidavit you were confused? No, I did not. And you're the president of the CEO. You know that it's important to be thorough, but you may have been confused when you wrote the affidavit that you're telling us? That's what I'm telling you, yes. So there could be a time today where you get confused. Correct? No, I do not think I will be confused today, but, but thank you. But you were confused when you did an affidavit? Yes. Okay. Not confused. Go ahead. I think it's skewed. Go ahead. Let's talk about your slogan, Be a Responsible Pet Owner. You came up with that slogan, correct? I did, and I'm very proud of it. You put the slogan on every piece of advertising that leaves Petsicon, correct? Yes, every piece of advertising. I would like to ask you, if I use the slogan, eat healthy, it leads to a long life, would I be teaching people how to eat healthy? Yes or no? No, I don't think so. If someone smokes cigarettes, that's pretty unhealthy. I would say so. I do not smoke. Would my slogan help that person? Yes or no? Oh, objection, Your Honor. Relevance? Your Honor, could you just give me three more questions? I'm getting to the point. Uh, I'm going to sustain the que the objection on the smoking on relevance grounds. You may proceed with your other questions. Ms. O'Connell, you must have some you must hear some terrible stories of misuse of pet products, correct? Um. Yeah, over my years, I work for a pet company, so yes, I've heard many stories. As a matter of a fact, you've been, you have been investigating, in fact, one that is here this evening. Mr. Stone, who investigates when, in, when injuries occur to animals from, their, from your products, correct? I, I don't even understand the question. What was the question? As a matter of fact, you have investigators. Oh, I have investigators. Mm -hmm. In fact, one is here this evening, Mr. Stone. Oh, yes, Mr. Stone is here. Yes, I saw him. And Mr. Stone investigates when injuries occur to animals from your products, correct? Absolutely. We take our product very seriously. So and you are familiar here. with Mr. Stone? He, he works for the company. I'm the CEO, so yes, I'm very familiar with him. He is your lead investigator. It is my understanding that you have many investigators, since he is the lead, right? He's the lead investigator, and yes, we have, I don't, I couldn't tell you, I didn't bring those statistics along, but yes, we have more than one investigator, if that's what you're trying and to And you me. are international, so you may have some investigators abroad, correct? Uh, yes, we, we, if there was a problem, we would either send someone from the United States, and we have people abroad. Our, our international division is small, though, so we'd probably send for some, for someone from the United States. Are you also familiar with Bill Thomas, yes or no? Bill Thomas, yes. What was his position? He was the director of research and development. He's a quack, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you felt that Mr. Thomas was a quack, why would you employ him? Uh, well, yeah, things happen to people. Uh, we hired Mr. Thomas. And, and Mr. Thomas worked for you for 10 years, correct? Yes, he worked for 10. And for many of those years, he was an excellent employee. Stress, pressures of life, things happen. Off your meds, things happen. Do you feel if a product is approved by the EPA, it is safe? Yes. Uh, well, it definitely gives it a um, gives it a stamp of approval. Let's put it like that. What products of yours usually receive the most EPA complaints? That would definitely be our uh, our um, flea line. I would say our 
our product line that contains flea pesticides. Yet you put most of your money from research and development into your food line? Um, we, yes, we put more money in our food line, yes. Could you please tell me the difference between type 1 and type 2 pyrethroids? Objection, Your Honor. Relevant. Oh, <laughs> no, the witness is not an expert. Uh, well, in her affidavit, she does explain what the difference between type 1 and type 2 pyrethroids, so she does know the difference. And what is the relevance of this question? This is highly relevant to the case. Because? Then we should. Because, because yeah. <laughs> but we don't have an expert right now. Uh, okay, well, let's I judge. tend to believe it's relevant, but I'd like to, uh, an explanation for why you think it's relevant. Uh, I believe that it is relevant because they put type 1 and two, type 2 pyrethroids into their products, so wouldn't it be very important for their CEO to understand the difference? I, when putting a product, pro product on the market. I'm going to deny the objection. Uh, Ms. O'Connell is the owner of this company. She knows the products. She has been testifying about the products and her knowledge of the products and how proud she is of the products. And I think that given the case that we have before us, uh, I think the question is relevant and will help the jury make a decision in the case. You may proceed. Can you tell me the differences between type 1 and type 2 pyrethroids? Uh, type 1 pyrethroids are, uh, must much have much less toxicity than type 2 pyrethroids. Type 2 pyrethroids are highly toxic. Uh, our company at one point did use them, uh, but we found that they were harmful to the pets, so we, did, we don't use them any longer. We only use type 1 pyrethroids which, like I said, are, are much less toxic and um, will not harm a pet. Or a small, especially a small dog, that's what you're concerned about. You cannot tell us why Sally Capella died, correct? Yes or no? Oh, I can absolutely not tell you why Sally Capella I'm, I'm terri I'm terribly sad for Yes or no? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you were put on notice in April 2011 that Petsicon products were unsafe, correct? What? Oh, uh, excuse me, can you repeat that question? You, okay. Ms. O'Connell, were put on notice in April of 2011 that Petsicon products were unsafe, correct? Uh, I, not that I recall. I would like to draw your attention to your affidavit. Is this your affidavit? Yes, you just showed it to me. Uh, do you recognize that to be your signature? I do. Here, line 48. In this same vein, I'm aware of le at least one internal memo addressed to me that has been made public by a disgruntled employee. Okay, thank you for refreshing my memory. <laughs> we take those complaints very seriously. In fact, you received a, mem a memo from Mr. Thomas, correct? Uh, you're telling me my affidavit says that. You wrote your affidavit. Your Honor, you're saying Mr. Thomas is not here to testify. Uh, is it in the affidavit? Yes. I will allow the question limited solely to the affidavit. Nothing more. In fact, you yourself requested that Mr. Thomas test the spot on product a second time. D I don't believe my affidavit says that. But I, I asked Mr. Thomas to test it? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I would like to read the exhibit marked, marked D1. Uh, is there any objection to D1 being read to uh, Ms. O'Connell? I object, Your Honor. Because? It's hearsay. Your Honor, in accordance with hearsay ex exception 5 colon 5 dash 5, state of mind, this exhibit shows both the state of mind of Pat O'Connell and Bill Thomas. In, accord in accordance with hearsay ex exception 5 colon 5 dash 7, relevant evidence, this memo is highly re relevant to the case. Also, it would be highly prejudicial to the plaintiff's case if this exhibit wasn't allowed into evidence. Who wrote the memo? Mr. Bill Thomas. And did he write it while he was an employee of Petsicon? Yes, he did. Do you have anything further you'd like to add to your objection? Any of the four of you representing this two billion dollars? <laughs> 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 legal team? Come on, someone. Make an objection. Um, you guys a small law firm or a royal rice? I object. 
I object, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Bill Thomas is not here to testify today to that email, and I feel that it is prejudicial if it is less to let it, if it is allowed into the case. Her affidavit does not mention. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. You're wrong. Right. I'm going to review the memo. And this memo was addressed to Ms. O'Connell, who is here today to testify. I'm going to deny the objection, and I'm going to allow the question. I think the, the exhibit is highly relevant. It is a memo written on Pepsicon Products letterhead, and I think it is uh, very important for the jury to hear about this testimony. To W. Pat O'Connell, President and CEO. From Bill Thomas, Director of Research and Development, date April 18, 2011. Reason, risk assessment for topical pet series. Per your request, I, ra I ran the numbers a second time on the topical se pet series. The, levels, the risk levels are off the charts. I can only res revise the baseline so many times before the continuum loses all its integrity. You pay me, as the head of research and development, to do my job, and that's what I'm trying to do. Pat, believe me, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at this. Morally and ethically, it's just not right. I think we should consider halting production until we can determine what exposure will be. Has anyone consulted legal on any of this yet? You and I both know how fragile public se sentiment can be. And what about the vets? If we lose them, it's just not about the topicals anymore. This may be out of line, but I need your assurances that if this all goes south, I'm not going to be out of a job. I know you hired me when you came in, and I appreciate that. I have a wife and two children now, and you, they are my main concern. I just feel when you don't return my calls and won't see me, something is going on. Please advise. Isn't it true that you have said in the past that you have zero tolerance for unsafe products? That is accurate. I do not have any tolerance for unsafe products. Thank you, Ms. O'Connell. No further questions. Good. Do your closing and then let I'm just going to do a couple comments. Okay. I can't help myself. That's right here. You guys are going to listen. <laughs> uh, I always ask, and I think good trial lawyers always ask, it kind of pounds at home, especially in this setting when your jury is going to be a little younger and they're not really going to, they may not really know what an affidavit is. So when you bring up an affidavit on cross-examination, and we do this with depositions, which are questions and answers and, uh, under oath, so when you gave your affidavit, you're under oath, correct? Yes. You, under oath means you had sworn to tell the truth. Someone write this down so that because uh, the things I forget. Oh. Okay. oh yeah, we're recording it even better. Okay. okay. Uh, so <laughs> affidavit. When you gave your affidavit, Ms. O'Connell, you were under oath, correct? And under oath means to tell the truth, correct? Just as as you are here today, to tell the truth, correct? Yes. And not only were you telling the truth when you did your affidavit, you knew that it could be used in a in a, uh, a court proceeding or trial like today, correct? Yes. And you wanted to because you knew it could be used, and you're under oath and telling the truth. You wanted to be as accurate and complete as you could. Isn't that true? Yes. So now, you've, you've set her up with the question of where well, she's inconsistent. You don't tell her right away that she's inconsistent. She says, oh, X. And then you go through those things. Like, well, now I want to show you your affidavit, which was eight months ago, or whenever it was, that's dated. And, and then that day, you didn't say that. You said, boom, 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 boom. That's what you said in the affidavit. Correct? Correct. And then, if Sometimes what you can do in closing, you don't need to always do it with the witness say, was she telling the truth then, or was she telling the truth now? She's here before you now telling you something totally different than she said in her affidavit. The affidavit's actually closer in time to when the events happened. What's more likely to be the truth? That, or eight, nine months later? Memories tend not to get better, they get worse. She's making, up, making it up to make it sound better for you in this trial. So I'll tell you link up the cross, and then in closing later. So I think that could be helpful. Um, I think going to what we talked about, the $2 billion company, which is good, I think you could, in terms of the investigators, you could start out a little bit of a lead. Say the fact is, you make some products that injure pets, don't you, in the past? You've had problems, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we've had it. She's going to say, yeah, we've had some unfortunate. So some of the products you put on the market actually have injured or killed some dogs, haven't they? Yes. So you actually have investigators to try to find out what problems your products are going to have in the marketplace, correct? Because you don't really know what the problems are when you send these products out there, do you? Bad. Bad for them. Good for you. 
<laughs> so, you know, think about that. You're like, oh my God, we're just doing that. So you, you make all this money, but you still, products get out there that aren't so good, right? Right. So that kind of links up that whole thing we were talking about, which I think really will be a problem for them if you do it the right way. Um, I like the difference between the R&D and the pharmaceutical, on the pharmaceutical side, really good. Um, on, the, on the different uh, pyrethroids, one and two, do they know, meaning Petsicon, do they know when this product was sent out, if it was one or two? No, but they had to stop making the number two. They don't know what was in this specific right, bottle. Right. So it doesn't say. You need to hammer that a little bit more. Say, so, oh, so you stopped using it because it was a problem. It was a problem, right? And using Pyrethroid 2 was causing a problem for pets, right? Right. And that wasn't good for your customers, right? Right. So even though you stopped using it, the fact is you don't know the product that Carmen used if it had one or two in it. You just don't know, do you? Well, you, if it was two, it's a very good chance that that could have caused a problem for Sally, right? So you could kind of just hit that a little bit more. Um, and uh, I think you did other than that. It was good. You did a good job of yes or no's, and she was a witness. You did well. So we can, we can do the closing if you want. Yep. That would be great. If you want to hear my comments. So, yeah. That's how that is. No chewing during the closing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard a lot of testimony. This is the plaintiff's time to leave you with a few thoughts prior to deciding the case. First, I am going to discuss the burden of proof. Carmen has the burden of proof. This means Carmen must prove negligence by a preponderance of the evidence. Simply stated, the plaintiff must prove that it is more likely that Petagon's product was responsible for Sally's death than not responsible. This is important that you understand this concept. Let me say it in another way. If you had a scale and weighed negligent versus non-negligent, the scale would tip in favor of Petagon being negligent. The plaintiff does not need to prove Petagon was negligent beyond doubt, nor does it need to prove Petagon intended to hurt Sally. Now, let's look at negligence. What is negligence? It is a departure from what a reasonable person would do in the same situation. The issues before you, the jury, are Number one, was Petsagon negligent by failing to warn? And number two, was Petsagon negligent in manufacturing the product? Let's look at the facts. Carmen described on direct she was a caring and loving pet owner and a thoroughly contempt owner. She had never owned a dog before Sally, but took the time to research the breeder, not simply by going to a local breeder, but driving many hours to West Virginia. She explained how she learned to care for Sally. She cared for Sally so well that people even suggested that Carmen enter dog competitions. This was not a slovenly person who does not read directions. No, Carmen is a thoroughbred herself. She made certain she followed directions. You heard, Carmen, you heard on direct, Carmen read the directions the evening of the incident. She applied the product appropriately. I submit to you an appropriate warning would have advised of the dangers of the product. An appropriate instru instruction does not only state, be a responsible pet owner. It explains how to use the product and the side effects. How difficult is it for the product to put a warning label on his product, one that may even suggest that you go on his website and look for the side effects. You heard the testimony today of Pat O'Connell, who stated that Petscon is a $2 billion company. They put 25% of its revenue back into its product, but not the most dangerous product the company sells, the product that earns its most money. I submit that is negligence. The failure to put a proper warning on his label is simple, but it means so much. Let's look at manufacturing defect. It appears from all the facts that Petsagon flea treatment was manufactured correctly at some point, as more dogs would have died, correct? But again, look at Pat O'Connell. She was put on notice that the product was faulty. What did she do? Did she immediately recall the product? No, 
Did she call a meeting to discuss the potential problem with the chemists on staff to understand the problem? No. In fact, she did nothing. Looking at the facts today, we know that she was put on notice the product was dangerous. It obviously could be prepared properly, but it was not when it left Petagon's control. Would a reasonable owner of a $2 billion company dismiss its leading employee's email? I submit negligence. Was Petsicon the proximate cause of the negligence? You heard Dr. Delani confirm it was. And finally, let's look at the damages. We heard Jameson St. Clair explain how a show dog can be valued. We heard a competition dog can win prize money, endorsement fees, breeding fees, appearance fees. Mr. St. Clair, a leading expert in the dog industry, valued Sally at upwards of $500,000. Today, we are asking you to render a decision in favor of the plaintiff and award damages of $500,000. We are asking you to render this, this decision not merely for Carmen, but for Sally, and for your dog, and for your neighbor's dog, and for any pet owner who relies on a $2 billion company and believes the company will provide top-of-the-line products only to be deceived. Thank you. give a little tag at the, at the beginning of the uh, closing and you could kind of hijack the opening and say at the beginning of the case we told you that this case was about X. I submit to you that the facts have shown that that's what this case is about and that we've met our burden of proof. And our burden of proof, I'm going to tell you, is a preponderance of the evidence. And then you did a great job explaining. I actually wrote down excellent the burden of proof. Really, really good. And I think you could just lead into that because I, I don't, and it's different obviously, in my, I don't like leading with the burden of proof. I actually usually end with it because I don't like dealing with it and people get confused. And I, my jurors can get confused, so I kind of just do it at the end and I kind of throw it away and it's dealt, it's dealt with. But I think you could just borrow the catch, the catch or tag that you put together and then just lead it right into your burden. That burden argument, burden argument will be great. It'll be real. It'll all make sense. And we've met that by our burden. I'm going to tell you about our burden now. Ponders the evidence. More likely, I wrote it down. Great. Um, I would just say with Carmen's testimony, just say what she said. Don't say on direct you heard her say. Because then it kind of makes it look like you're trying to hide from the cross. So I would just say, you heard Carmen tell you. And just get it out there. Because um, I, I just don't think you, I don't think you needed it. Um, uh, on the warnings, I think you could say that they, put, they, they spend the time and effort to put the warnings on the food where they make 75% of the money. Because I, thought, I, I just wrote that down, food. I like that on the R&D, the 25% goes mostly to food. Um, I like that. I think this was, one, this was the, the, only, the only issue I really had was on the more dogs would be dead if they didn't get it right. I think that's a good argument if it's rephrased. I think you could say, we know that this problem, this product was a problem from Mr. Thomas's memo and the evidence in this case that they were using pyrothyroid twos at one time and Ms. O'Connell even told you that they were dangerous and they killed dogs. They caused toxicity and they had to get rid of the thyroid twos. But nobody knows whether or not the thyroid, pyrothyroid twos we're in the Carmen's product that was used on Sally. So, um, bear with me. So, they got it right and they fixed this product at some point because their investigators went out and heard the dogs were having problems. But they didn't spend the time, energy, or effort to do it right when they released it when they wanted to make money and add to the $2 billion. I, I, and that's what you were trying to say. I, that's what I understood you wanted to say, Caroline, and I thought it's a really good argument. I just think it needs to be spun around as opposed to, because when you say, oh, we know they got it right because more dogs would have died, that makes it, that, that suggests 
a little bit too heavy for them, you want to flip that and make it really their weakness, not a strength. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Because I think it's a really good point. Just if you make it the right way, it'll be really, 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 really effective. Uh, and I liked that they did nothing. There was no notice. That was that follow-up explanation was really, really strong. I liked that a lot. Um, on the damages, I liked it. I think it's nice. We're at what you're telling, and this is what we tell people. And I teach a lot of classes to trial lawyers and stuff. We always say you have to task the jurors with their responsibility. What is their job? What do they need to decide? What questions are they going to have to answer when the judge gives them the law and gives them questions to answer? And you did. We're asking you to do X. That's really, really good. Especially someone for your age to do that. That's really, that's really good. That, that's the. But you. Would, I'm at, we're asking you to find for us and to award five hundred thousand dollars. Tell them what you want. If you don't tell them, they don't know. So we try to tell them as much as we can. Now, I think to take on your weakness of the speculative, speculative damages, I would say we're asking you for this amount of money because we submit to you it's fair and reasonable because Sally was two years old. She was going to stay in dog shows. She was, we, you heard she was going to get endorsements. She was going to get appearance fees and the other things they talked about and say, you know, Carmen, I think you can see, was a conscientious dog owner, took good care of Sally. She was going to keep doing it. And if she kept going on those shows, I think it's fair and reasonable to expect that she would have won. If you think she would have won less, award less. If you think she would have won and been successful to make 500, you can give her the 500,000. And by the way, don't forget about the value, the, the, the cost of 2,000. You can just chuck that in if you want. If you don't want it, you don't have to. But that's how I would handle the 500 or lower. Because the jury might, you know, it gives them a good say. We think it's fair and reasonable. If you think something less is fair and reasonable, you heard different numbers. You do what you think is appropriate. But we think fair and reasonable is 500. She was young. She's a healthy, successful dog, and would only gotten better. I think mean, if you say, and that's and that's just a little. It's there, just an extra thing to add on. But I think you're well on your way, and you're all going to do great. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Good luck. And, ha and most importantly, have fun because okay, good. So uh, I have to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, please. Don't remind me how old I am. That is really sweet. Thank you. 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 Thank you.